Hello and welcome to another edition of Government in Focus. I am Liran Brummel. We're chatting with the Honorable Attorney General, Mr. Anil Nandlal, joining us to tell us about his plans uh, for going forward and taking government's agenda. Mr. Nandlal, thank you very much for joining us. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you here. And I want to take this opportunity also to say good evening to all your listeners and viewers across Guyana and uh, elsewhere. Thank you very much. Been a long road. Government in effect just over a week now. Let's talk about your personal mindset at this point before we go anywhere else. You have been at the forefront of efforts of the fight. How are you feeling at this stage? I am happy, I am relieved, and at the same time, I cannot help but feel a deep sense of regret. I am happy and I am relieved because democracy has been restored in our country. Dark forces attempted to derail our democratic process. Forces attempted to thwart and defeat the will of the electorate. And in so doing, they threatened the very nation state of Guyana. Statements were uttered, actions taken, if they are subjected to proper legal analysis, they would constitute an attempt almost to overthrow a legally elected government of a country. I am happy because that Guyana survived that challenge. The Guyanese people demonstrated to the world their level of maturity, good judgment, they resisted all sorts of temptation. They sustained great inflammatory gestures and invitations. And they exercised great calm and patience at a time when it was so required for this very survival of us as a society and for us as a people and as a country. And I'm happy that my people and my country survived that ordeal. I am sad because of what our people and our country had to endure for no reason at all. All because of a selfish group of people who lost an election and refused to relinquish government in accordance with the Constitution, in accordance with the rule of law, and in accordance with democratic traditions as we know it. I don't care what they say and how it is being said. That truth cannot be covered, cannot be hidden. That is what it was, a grab for power. Let me complete. I am saddened because the world saw how uncivilized we can be, how ruthless we can be, how cruel we can be to each other, how primitive we can be. And that was showcased to the world. And that leaves in me as a Guyanese, a deep sense of sadness. And it tells me about the amount of work that we have to do to heal, to reconcile, to educate, and to nurture our people so that this tragedy and travesty will never occur again. And no generation in the future will have to endure what our generation went through. 
I don't know how much you were affected, but people right across this divide, right across Guyana, right across the ethnic divide, even political divide, even in the diaspora, people got sick. People got, people suffered tremendous pain, anguish. People got suffered depression because of what they were seeing, because of the tension. People pressure, where blood pressure went up because of what the country was going through. And the matter was complicated and compounded by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, all of that came together in an economic situation that um, cannot be, 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 be said to be healthy. All the productive sectors were done even before COVID, before the elections. The economy was at an all-time all low. Commerce and trade had declined drastically. The private sector and the manufacturing sector report that it has reduced by some 60% trade and commerce. All of our exports were productive sectors not performing. And then we moved into this election, and then the COVID hit us at that level of weakness and fragility. Therefore, Guyanese people really went through an ordeal. And that's, and, and that's what I'm saying, that I don't wish that to happen to any uh, future generation of Guyanese. In what you said just now, bringing, dividing, do you think we can heal? Do you think, as a nation, we can come back from that? And if so, how does the Dr. Irfan Ali government plan to bridge this divide that was created from this process? The fact, the fact that I'm sitting with you in this studio as Attorney General is testimony to the fact that we can heal. That those forces that wanted to disintegrate and destroy our society did not succeed. The fact that they did not succeed means that they didn't get the support of the Guyanese public. They thought they had. And many times when they tried to bring the people on the street to cause the chaos and confusion and violence which they wanted to create, they failed abysmally. They said, for example, the night that we were debating the no confidence motion, that they would put 8,000 people in front of the parliament. They couldn't put 80. Many times during this period, they said that they are going to burn and they're going to destroy and they're going to make the, you know. It didn't happen. They sent trucks into villages with music, trying to excite people and provoke people and incite people. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. Therefore, I am saying to you that we have, as a people, matured. We have reached a level and we have proven that this incident, this tragedy has allowed the world to see that. And we as a people demonstrated that by not falling prey to the temptations that were you know, hanging before us and, 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 and shown to us. We didn't react that way. And that's why I'm saying to you that 20 years ago, perhaps they could have put those people on the streets. 20 years ago, they could have created that kind of mayhem. In fact, they did. This time around, when they tried it, it didn't happen. And they had with them the power of the state apparatus. They had the might of the state behind them. And they were unable to do it. They were unable to do it because the people our Guyanese public, our Guyanese citizens did not want to go down that road. They don't want their country to go down that road. So what you found happening, you had a political elite group that didn't have the support. They didn't have the support to carry out the agenda and to execute that plan that they had to stay in, the, stay in government. So yes. For those reasons, I am saying that, yes, we can easily heal. 
we can easily heal. And the president in every one of his public pronouncements so far, every one of them, he made special emphasis of his intention and the government's intention to work towards developing a country that will benefit every Guyanese, shaping policies and implementing policies that will impact positively the lives of every single Guyanese. And every one of his public pronouncements so far, he has um, emphasized the need to build a cohesive, united Guyana where every Guyanese citizen can feel that they have an equal place and are treated equally and can benefit equally from the resources of this country. I have no superior right to anything in Guyana over and above you. You have none over me. We are equal as citizens of this country when we are vying for state resources. And our government, it is in our manifesto, and our ministers are saying it. Our president is leading by example, and I am here to make, well, to reiterate that commitment once again. That said, is there a plan, and this is twofold, is there a plan or intent of government to reach across the political divide, to ask a question of the now opposition. Are you going to sit and support us? These are our policies. This is where we want to go. Piggybacking on parliamentary and governance minister's statement calling for a mature parliamentary democracy on Friday. Well, the opposition is not yet known because the list who will list of MPs to go to, parliament. Oh. to go to Parliament has not yet been made public. So we have to see who those persons are. I have some views. I believe that there are certain persons, and this, this is not necessarily the government view, this is the view of Anil Nandlal. Let me make, put that caveat out. Julie, Julie noted. I believe that over the past five or six months, there are certain persons because of their behavior, because of their conduct, because of what they have said, have disqualified themselves from being part of the political leadership of this country. They are unfit and improper to lend leadership to the people of this country because they attempted to destroy this country. They attempted to destroy the lives of the people of this country. They put this nation into serious jeopardy and expose us to serious risks. And in my view, those people should not hold public office ever again. That is my view. The government view is we will work with the opposition. Hopefully, it will not constitute some or all of those people to whom I have made reference. Hopefully, we have a fresh group of people who have the interest of Guyana and Guyanese at heart. And I emphasize that because the last group who masqueraded as leaders in government did not have the best interest of Guyana and the best interest of Guyanese. And they demonstrated that to the world. They illustrated that for everyone to see. So no one should be in doubt. There is nobody who cares for this country. No political leader who is responsible and cares for his constituents would expose their lives to danger so that they can stay in power illegally, illegally. They knew that they lost the elections. Every single one of them are seasoned politicians. They're educated people. They're not dunces. 
They knew that they lose that, those elections on March the 3rd. The same time that we knew that we won and the same way that we knew that we won, they knew that they lost. And to keep on and thinking that in 2020 you would be able to steal through a spreadsheet by Bingo and through a flawed report through Low and Field and then prosecute that illicit agenda to the very end, putting this nation on the edge, on the precipice of disaster, taking us there as far as possible. It took monumental strength to put back the ship in Guyana, to bring it back into safety. They took it as far as possible into turbulent waters for it to be destroyed if they can't get to rule and govern. In my view, my brother, those people should not be in any uh, position of government because they are unfit to lead our people. Now, let me recognize that the PNC has a very important constituency. Very important constituency. A constituency that may never vote for the PVP, may never support the PVP. A constituency that we will continue to work in the PVP to bring over, to win over in all our endeavors. And that's our, that's our duty as politicians, to win over every constituency. But it's a constituency that must, is deserving of proper leadership. And the PVP is prepared to lend that leadership to that constituency as far as possible. But the type of leadership that we have seen, it's not good for the country and it's not good for anyone. Anyone. People are deserving of better leadership than that. So I am hoping, having said all of that, I'm hoping that we will have responsible opposition on the other side of the parliamentary aisle, with whom we can work responsibly, not necessarily to support our political positions, but to support our po posi positions that are in the national interest. interest. The PUP would never want um, you to, you know, vote PPP or, you know. We are here to build a country. We have a vision. Our manifesto was not crafted at Freedom House in a back room in isolation by two or three persons. We consulted nationally across this country. We had a big symposium, if you recall, at the new thriving restaurant at Providence. Yes. We took submissions on board from every sector in this country, from the agri sector, from all the productive sectors, from the private sector, from the religious organizations, from the labor movement, from ethnic-based organizations, and, and we amassed that together and consolidated it in one document. So that document, the policies and promises contained in that document, they, they meet the expectations of every sector of our country and every segment of our population, irrespective of geographic location, ethnicity, religion, etc., etc. So we would like an opposition that will partner with us as far as possible in moving that plan forward. Of course, it, they are free to come up with proposals of their own. And we will welcome discussing it with them and see if they can merge into ours. Or sometimes we may be so impressed with it that we take it over wholesale and adopt it. And adopt it. You, 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 in, in You've touched on a number of things <laughs> that I wanted to segue into, but while we're on that topic of working, uh, of, of, of manifestos and, and, and looking at, at, at national programs of national interest, what is the role of the AG, the AG's office in, as you spoke about the wide consultation and the manifesto, what is the AG's role in fulfilling that of government and uh, and, and moving the country. Bearing in mind, you also said, we came back from the precipice. All right. Constitutionally, the Attorney General is the principal legal advisor 
of the government of Guyana, including His Excellency the President. Government is run by laws, not men. A government that is not a government by law or of law is a government that is not legal. Governmental responsibilities arise out of a pact between the people and the state. That pact or contract is called the Constitution. A Constitution captures the aspirations of the people, the goal of the people, and the objectives of a government. And that Constitution is supported by a body of laws that add meat to that skeleton. The Attorney General is to ensure that the government traverse along that legal pathway laid out in the Constitution and in the various laws. That whatever policies the government wishes to implement, whether they be economic, whether they be environmental, whether they be social, they must be done within the legal free, extant legal framework in the country. So it doesn't collide, a policy can't collide with a constitution, constitutional provision, can't collide with the law. So generally the government, that, that's the role of the Attorney General. Uh, and then obviously at an individual level to advise the government on transactions that the government will necessarily have to enter into in the execution of its functions as government. Every government has to take a loan. The Attorney General has to peruse the terms of the loan and see that it meets the legislative framework of the country. Right. Then all legal contracts. You have contracts with every day. A contract is signed with a contractor or someone or some company for something that the government wishes to procure or some, 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 some governmental endeavor. All of that. Then um, ministers have to get legal advice on matter on, on how to you know carry out their everyday responsibilities and on on any given matter because as i said a, a government is governed by law so the attorney general has to be there to guide the ministers um, then you have the parliament there's another arm of government and that is very important because parliament represents the people it's, it's the meeting place of the people. That is why you're elected to that parliament. Everyone who sits in that parliament represents about four or 5,000 people, one seat. Right, one seat. And when you add that, that's electorate. Those are the people who voted at the elections. So every member of that parliament, he stands for five or 6,000 people. The major function of the parliament is to hold the executive government accountable to the people. Government is run by public monies, taxpayers' monies, and monies collected, you know, from loans, etc. That is the forum where the government explains how much money it receives and how much money it has to spend and what it is spending it on. And the role of the opposition is to oversight the government in the expenditure funds. Also, another important function of parliament is for government to take its policies there for discussion with the people. Because remember, the government represents one right. section of the population too. And it has to get the approval, or at least the input, of the other section of the population. Par as we're, you, and of course, Parliament is a place where you pass all the laws in the country. The Attorney General plays a pivotal role in all of that because Parliament also is regulated by the Constitution and by the laws. Every law has to meet the test of constitutionality because our Constitution is a supreme law. It is the duty of the Attorney General to go through the laws clause by clause to ensure there is no conflict with the Constitution and with other laws. Because you want, to, you want to bring laws into force that are in harmony with each other. You don't want any discord even among your legislation. So that's another important role of Parliament. 
Huh? And then you, I, so, so that, those are the general, general duties yes. of the Attorney General. Then you ask me now about the current state of the country, having regard to what the antecedents are. Well, since the passing of the no confidence motion on the 21st of December 2018, the constitutional character of the country changed. The country went into a different legal and constitutional mode as a result of that constitutional event. The government of the day was mandated to remain in office for three months, within which, within which they were supposed to hold an election. Upon the passing of the motion also, cabinet, inclusive of the president, ought to resign, and the president ought to remain in office until those elections are held and another president elected through that election within that three months period. All those time frames were tossed aside by this administration, the previous administration. Just tossed aside. After that, Guyana began to run on an unconstitutional or, or at least an extra constitutional track. Because if those constitutional events do not happen, then the whole e constitutional equation breaks up. And when that happens, then the country goes awry. So Guyana became, the government of Guyana became illegal by March um, 21st or thereabouts of 2019. You know, we went to the CCJ. The CCJ, in its benevolence, said, look, 28th of September is when your three months would have done. Because they put the clock on hold to facilitate the litigation, the CCJ. I have my misgivings about whether that's possible. No court can amend the Constitution. The Constitution can perhaps do something about the court, but the Constitution can't, no court can put the constitutional clock on hold. If the constitutional clock says that something must happen within a certain time, there is no court that can put a hold on that. So uh, certainly, a court may by an order do that, but the court has to be specifically empowered to do that by the very Constitution. But certainly, the filing of an action of any type can put that on hold. But that the CCJ is our highest court, and they made an order saying that the, six mo the three months that they had began to run from the date of the CCJ's judgment. I think it was June the 18th. I can't remember. And so by September the 18th, the three months would have expired. So they were given a, a lease of life again to September the 18th. Again, they did not comply. And therefore, they became doubly legal if, if there is such a, a, a concept after that. And then they didn't even hold elections until March, another three months. So they took from they took an entire year. So for one year, the constitutional clock of Guyana was thrown out of the window. The constitution itself was thrown out of the window, and the government was just operating. As I said, government is government by law. This was government not by law. This was government by executive edict. So all the time frame that a constitution, our constitution has in place for events to take place in a calendar year, all have been violated. So the time for the dissolution of parliament was messed up because parliament was supposed to have been dissolved in anticipation of the elections of the election. project provided for under Article 106 of the constitution upon the passage of a successful passage of a no confidence motion. That didn't happen, right? 
parliament was dissolved at some at the women fancy of the president. He included in the constitution a condition for the holding of elections. And that condition is the readiness of GCOM. If the framers of the constitution wanted to say that a constitution and election can only be held if GCOM is ready or upon the signaling of the election commission that they are ready to hold such an election, we don't have a shortage of ink and paper in this country as far as I'm aware. We would have put that in the constitution. So all manner of foolishness they started to invent so as to justify the violation of the law. And, and any government, brother, any government that treats the law and the constitution in such a fashion will lose an election. And anybody who doesn't believe that, they saw it. I have always said that the greatest creation of mankind is the law. And whenever you mess with the law, whenever you disrespect the law, it will destroy you. And it is the law that destroyed them. The same law that they disrespected. So let me complete the, the, the point. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any budget within the time required. The, the calendar year, the financial calendar year, begins at January the 1st and it ends at December the 31st. The budget that they, they passed, the last budget they passed, was in this November of 2018 for the year 2019. The Constitution says that a budget must be passed within, not without, within 90 days from the commencement of the year. 90 days is approximately three months. three months. So a budget supposed to have been passed in March, right? This is August and there is no budget. The Constitution further provides that until you pass this budget, you are entitled to use a certain fraction of the previous year's budget. And when, when you bring the budget within the 90 year period, you 90 bring days. 90 days period, sorry, you bring all the expenses and you include it in the Appropriation Act so that you get parliamentary approval for that too. But all of that is predicated on a 90 day period. They, that 90 day period has gone. So they are using, or they were using, monies from the previous budget, but beyond the 90 day period. And the Constitution also says that you can only use it for continuing the ordinary activities of government. Not, in other words, you can't go build a new hospital. That's a capital project. That's completely illegal. So, all these violations continue up to today. Now, Parliament is supposed to convene within a stipulated period after an election. And that stipulated period is, I, I believe, um, I can't remember, but it's about, um, about two months maximum. This election was completed since March. Six months afterwards, we have no parliament. So right now, there is, no, there is not even a deadline for us to go to parliament. Because all deadlines have expired and have been violated. I say that to explain to you that the entire government has to be lifted and put back on constitutional track so that it can run a legal course. How Everything has been thrown aside. How then is that going to be done, of putting the Constitution back on this legal track? Well, first of all, we have to understand where we are. And that's what we have been doing for the past week. Understanding the status quo. Where are we financially? We, we understand that forestry is bankrupt. These are places where we left hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. The forestry fund, the bank account of the forestry is empty. Done, finish. GGMC, a few billion dollars gone. Housing, we had a fund there, that gone, empty. The lotto fund, virtually depleted. The central bank is, I don't know how much, hundred million dollar deficit. 
and in overdraft with a hundreds of millions of dollars of treasury bills. In the, in the, 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 the reserves are dangerously low. All the macroeconomic signals are signaling distress in every facet of the economy. So we are coming to grips with that now because you have to pass a budget. How do you pass a budget if you don't have an assessment of your financial strength? You can't go and budget for money that you don't have, budget to spend money that you don't have. And you have a hell of a time finding where the monies are. Imagine when we left government, we give these people all the bank accounts with billions of dollars, and we were accused of hiding these monies in commercial banks when we deliberately opened the accounts in commercial banks so that we can put money at the disposal of commercial banks, state monies, to put into the banking system to enhance lending. These people have no understanding of how finances work. I, I believe they lack common sense. Now, all the accounts they have left empty. And they have nothing to show. What do they have to show for it? You will hear the Minister of Public Works will report soon in the state of the airport. And that's our project. What they did to that project was they renegotiated. Um, they ended up in a smaller project, a project, smaller airport at a higher price. The East Coast Road as our project. Our project approved before we left. And those are the two major infrastructure projects they've done. What, the West Coast Road, if you can remember, that project was signed under our government. The, the, the Breeding Hoop to Parika Road. That's the other major infrastructure project. They have done nothing. And they have emptied the treasury and all the account monies that we had in the various funds. So we have to get back into parliament, we will have, I don't know how the Auditor General will manage, because he will have a hell of a time in justifying, well not justifying, but in doing the accounts. Because they are in total disarray, monies that are supposed to, must receive parliamentary approval before it is spent, have been spent. These guys have been going into the treasury as though it is their private safe at home and just pulling down money. $1.6 billion spent on a, what they're calling a hospital and there's not a bed in the hospital. And now we are being told by some company that they own the hospital. They own the property that's not even the government and the government owes them rent. I mean, what level of crazy you have to be to spend $1.6 billion on a property that you're not sure that you own? Yeah, you're jumping on a number of things and I can't touch on everything at once. I know, I know. We, we were supposed to be talking law, but we, 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 we ventured off into a few things. Two things I come to ask, based on what you said, and I'm picking out the two. You talk about bringing the country back on the constitutional path, which means we've got to go back to Parliament very soon. Yes. And you're talking about a budget because in the next few weeks we anticipate what is the fact-finding, what is the understanding, what is the tailoring of the yeah. budget. So two questions. What is the projection on the time to go back to Parliament, one? And two, what is the projection on the time for government to present a budget? Well, it would depend upon, look, the, the time is the earliest possible time. The earliest possible time. The next question you'll ask me, well, when will that when be? When will you ask right. <laughs> the time? It is difficult for me, mm -hmm. sitting here, to make that projection, simply because it is not in my sphere, the issue of finance. The vice president and the president, as you know, are both people very highly trained in economics and finance. Finances. And that's a fortunate thing because they have that task at hand and that's what they are doing. So what I do know is that it is a priority to have a budget. May not be a full budget, but a budget in which we have to put money back into the system. 
get the economy going. Government in an economy like ours, that's not as diversified as we would like to be, not as large as we would like to be, government remains the most important player in the economy. Government is the largest purchaser. Government is the largest payer. Government money dominates an economy like ours. Right now, there is no, there is no money. So we need to do that. Then importantly, we have to provide goods and services to our people. We have to do that. We have to get money quickly to deal with COVID. You see how many kits we were able to get in one week? And these guys have been there for six months and they, can't, they can't, could not have gotten a fraction. And do you know that we still, we discovered, though it caused a big um, upheaval at the time, and I thought that they had sorted it out, you know that when you take a COVID test, your result still goes to the minister and then goes back to the doctor so for, to inform the patient. That still happens. And we only know that because Dr. Anthony is there. So, you, you, to come back to your question, it's a lot of things that have to be taken into account, but we will have to submit our names and get Parliament going as early as possible. And one of the first items on the agenda would be um, to pass a budget of some type to legitimize spending and to bring more money out, where we, get, where we will get the money from, is also part of the process, also part of uh, factor in the equation that will determine how long, because we are in pursuit of raising this money, finding it wherever it, it is. Because the government, this government, as far as I'm aware, is not very helpful at all. You don't want to go into the sphere of it, I understand that. The question that is going to be asked now based on your discussion on what has been uncovered, and it mainly comes from the side of the public sector, with what you've said has been discovered, have been discovered so far in terms of the spending and, 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 and empty bank accounts. Public servants always ask the question, how is this going to affect what I take home to feed my family at the end of the month? Is there an assurance, is there a look right now from the government to say salaries for public servants are fine? we are going to look at the budget in the shortest possible time. But be assured. I, I have heard nothing that would lead me to believe that public servants' salaries are going to be negatively affected. Or generally, their welfare. And I want to take this opportunity here again to assure public servants that they are not going to be victimized or witch hunted. There are political appointments that we have to address and address frontally. You have people who are totally unqualified, and I'm speaking about hundreds if not thousands of them in all the ministries, and who have been given political contracts, contracts of employment, for political reasons. They are called sinecure appointments. And they are scattered right across the public sector in every ministry by the dozens all over the place. Now, those contracts will necessarily have to be terminated. First of all, it is a bloat on the public sector wage bill. You have some jobs I never hear about. For example, head of public parks, a man getting $500,000 take home a month, all his light bill, phone bill being paid. He has guards at his house, his internet being paid. He has um, a driver and a car. He gets a duty-free allowance in an A grade, whatever that means, I presume is the highest type of vehicle. And he gets um, a gratuity of 22.5% two, two every six months. And this is a guy, when I find out, is hardly ever in Guyana. But he is the director of public parks. Well, what is that? 
What is that? And you have hundreds of those creations all over the ministries. In office of the president, in every ministry, you have a whole set of them. They, they just make up some names and give these people jobs. And they're not, I don't know that they're even qualified. I see a man who's a political advisor who I know personally. I don't even know that this man ever studied politics or he was ever in politics. I know he's a friendly with someone in politics, but he's a political advisor in the office of the president. This week, we are going to release dozens of these contracts, and ministers are going to hold press conferences, and they will be speaking about them. You will hear them for yours. So the, and the public servants, I want them, I'm giving them notice now, to look at their salary, look at their salary, and look at the salaries of those who were hired by contract as sinecure appointments and do a comparison. And then you will see the raw deal the people of this country got from the previous administration. We are not going to say it. That's why I don't, I don't really want to say much. I, the papers will be there. The documents that they sign will be made public and you will judge. I, I, I am in a ministry where the lawyers, the lawyers at the bottom level take home $180,000 per month. And they represent the state of Guyana. They represent the entire police force. They represent the army. They represent the, every public ministry. They represent all the, the apparatuses of the government, all. And they take home 180,000. They have lawyers who have been ensconced in ministries. And these are the lawyers I'm talking about have been working with the state for a long time now, and they have that salary, right? You have lawyers now ensconced in different ministries around the government, and they are paid on a special contract for 500,000 right across the government apparatus. And those people, when you check them, they, they, are, they are just come back from law school or they just joined, the, you know, they just admitted to the bar. Right across the board, you have that. Now, how is that? Is that fair? You're asking me to what to tell the public servants. I want to tell the public servants to look at those. And that is what this coalition government did. That is why when we said, during while we were in the opposition, we said repeatedly, that they were only governing Guyana for a few people. We were not bluffing. We will release from Nisil in due course the hundreds of properties that were disposed. You will see the process, if there is any, how the, what, what tender, what, what what process of, of, of how did you make this public? But you will see huge blocks of land sold. No process. You have an agreement of sale. The smallest fraction is paid down, but a vesting order is granted, meaning that the person gets title in the name. Let us say the price purchase price is 200 million. They pay, one person paid on 1 million and they get the title in their name, owing the state 199 million. Now you tell me why those people should not go to jail. Look at, <laughs> look at what Ashley Singh and Brassington get charged for. Selling, we went to tender. We put public advertisements in the newspapers. We sold to the highest bidder, and yet, Ashni Singh and Brassington were handcuffed. Here, you have no process, no valuation. A man has not paid a fraction, a mere fraction of the price as a deposit, but he has tightly in his name. All those transactions were fully paid for at market value. You know what they charge those people for? They said the valuation certificate was wrong because they brought a valuation 
sort of evaluator who value the property at a different price. And that is what Ashley Singh is charged for. That's why when I was doing the case, I told the Chief Justice that Parliament is no longer legislating laws. A valuation officer now is legislating. Because you can be jailed because a valuation officer offers a different opinion from what market value has produced. And a man goes to jail because of the opinion of a valuation officer. That's what they charge people for under the PVP administration. You understand? So we have a lot of things to talk about and a lot of information will flood the public domain in the next few weeks. You will see. AG, you started a whole conversation. But we're going to have to put a pin in it now because we're out of time. We must have you back in, though, to, to have a discussion after you've set your agenda because we, we, we've spoken about what you want to do. How you want to get there, we have to talk about. What are your next steps? But that has to be another <laughs> discussion yeah, well, because, you know, closing, closing, closing. Oh, closing you've off. come to the end already. <laughs> you, you realize that we finished okay. an hour already, Jack Easy. I, I, I just realized that. <laughs> um, I thought I would, I would have got a chance to speak about the AG chambers, but I didn't get to speak about that. But, but Let's we'll pen back. that down for we'll, a second. We'll come back. We'll we'll come we'll back. Um, um, let me thank you, Mr. Rommel, for having me here. Um, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Um, and I also um, want to thank your viewers and listeners for accommodating us in, our, in their homes. I hope that they have learned a little. And um, I am only dealing with, I have only dealt with matters at the tip of the iceberg. The subject ministers, when they begin to speak, will have the real details. And, you know, these are the things that um, the public, will, we have a duty. Remember, people, do, people uh, sometimes forget that uh, government has a fiduciary duty over state assets. And you know, not because you're in government, you can deal with assets in a particular way. And um, you have a responsibility for, for, to, you know, to treat the people of our country fairly. Um, so, so a lot of information will be in the public domain to give uh, the people of Guyana an idea of how how we have performed as a country and how the, the, the government has performed over the past five years, they are entitled to know that. They are entitled to know the state of their economy. They are entitled to know this, the, the, you know, the state of the... We have not even touched the oil and gas industry yet. yet. We are going to get there and get into the contracts and, and um, a lot of work um, have to be done, as you would appreciate. And we have hit the ground running. Our president is very um, excited and energetic um, and you know we have the guidance of the vice president a very experienced man and also the general secretary of our party there to lead us forward and uh, we have a good team we have a young team um, comparatively we are babies compared to your your previous your uh, previous government um, the average age here should be in its 40s the average age there was over 65, old age pension um, level. Not to disrespect the old people, but just to mention a, um, a, a fact. Uh, so we have young, energetic, exuberant leadership, and um, we, 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 we have made a pledge that we will deliver us to our best of our ability, and um, it's our expectation that we'll do that. Attorney General Arnold Nandala, thank you very much for joining us. This has been another edition of Government in Focus. We'll be having quite a few of these uh, in the coming days. Thank you for tuning in. Be safe and take care of each other.